Hello friends, welcome to our channel. In this series are telling the stories of men who were popes and helped to build the papal empire that lasted 1260 years from 538 to 1798. Before telling the story of Bishop Vigilius, we gotta go back a little in the past in order to have a context. In the year 328, Constantine had transferred the capital of the empire to the far, far away Constantinople, today known as Istanbul in Turkey. The higher of the Roman Empire with its glory of conquest and riches were gone for a long time. During the 4th century, the empire remained unified with its headquarters in Constantinople. At the end of the century, Emperor Theodosius established the final division in 395. Roman Empire of the West with capital in Rome and Roman Empire of the East, also called the Byzantine Empire, with capital in Constantinople. The also popular cities of Rome suffered an urban exodus. Citizens went to live in the countryside and the city deteriorated. The Germanic peoples that had long been pressured in the borders of the empire ended up being admitted between the borders and occupying many lands and territories. Eventually, they became so strong that Rome, the capital of the Western Empire, was invaded several times. The Visigoths sacked Rome in 410, and the Vandals in 455. The Franks, after sacking Rome, occupied Gaul, today known as France. The Anglo-Saxons and Jews invaded Britain, today known as England. The Burgundians, the south of France, and Lombards, northern Italy, etc. Now pay attention to this. In 476, the Heruli, led by Odoacer, deposed the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire, Romulus Augustus. The imperial insignia were sent to the emperor of the East, who thus became the emperor of Rome. But in fact, the Barbaros peoples were now in charge of the once powerful city. Thus, in the year 535, we find Rome dominated by the Ostrogoths and having Theodatus as king, and as bishop of Rome, Agapitus I. We say bishop of Rome because the title Pope was not yet used at that time, but we're going to use it here for didactical purposes. Agapitus was the son of Gorgianus, a Roman priest murdered in the riots during the time of Pope Symmachus. Wait a minute, Pope son of a priest? Yes, my friend, this was coming those times. The church had not invented this story of celibacy yet. Now we're going to meet the other characters in our story. Emperor Justinian, in addiction to being an emperor, he considered himself a great theologian. Empress Theodora, who in fact has a very interesting story. Before being the empress, she was an actress and how could I say, a lady of the night. There are no records in history about what sexual spells she used with Emperor Justinian. The fact is that they got married with all pomp and circumstance. Theodora, Empress now, was coated with so much holiness that she and her husband waged a campaign against her former colleagues. Hundreds of prostitutes from Constantinople were imprisoned in convents against their will, so that from then on they could live modest lives. Many went crazy with the arrest and many committed suicide. This guy here is General Belisarius. He deserved his own video just to tell his story. He won many battles with much law forces in number. However, he was a top strategist and knew how to use information and this information confused the enemy. And this is Antonina, his wife, a very influential woman. This is Pope Silverius. We are going to tell his story very soon, just wait a little. And finally, we have our main actor, Pope Vigilius. Let's get started. Vigilius was a Roman by birth. He belonged to a wealthy family, so it was natural to follow the ecclesiastical career, since this way it was easier to achieve prestige and honors in those times. A writer of that time declares, his character was violent and overwhelmed in a fit of cholera. He beat to death a little boy who refused to have sex with him. Truth or rumors? If it's true, it's no wonder, since many bishops of Rome were fond of boys, I'll tell you the story of one by one of these popes during this series. In 535, the Pope of the occasion, Agapitus, remember him, made a trip to Constantinople and took Deacon Vigilius with him. It's good to remember that during those times, the Emperor had a profound influence in everything that was discussed and decided in the church. Indeed, since Constantine times it was like that. Arrived Constantinople, Vigilius fell in favor of the Empress, 
who saw him secretly and asked the following question, Would you like to be the Bishop of Rome someday? But of course, Virginius replied, Well, then I finance you. In return, I want you to recognize the bishops Antimus, Severus, and Timothy, and renounce the decrees of the Chalcedony. Can you do that? It's obvious that Vigilius promised to do everything that Theodora asked of him. Then Theodora gave him 700 pieces of gold. That was a lot of money back then, and today too. 700 golden coins, can you imagine that? Vigilius also took letters from the empress to be delivered to Belisarius, the general of the imperial art. There is an explanation here. During these times, there were many theological fights between the various bishops of the Eastern Church and Western bishops, of whom the Bishop Rome was just one more. One of these theological discussions was about monophysitism. Monophysitism? What is that? Well, let me explain very quickly. It is the belief that Jesus had only one nature, that is, the divine nature. Eastern bishops defended this belief. Western bishops didn't, and that generated endless disputes between them. And so Agapirus was a fiercer fighter of monophysitism, said that he didn't recognize Antimos, Severius, and Timothy, Eastern bishops and defenders of the theory. The fact is that shortly after this conversation between Theodore and Vigilius, poor Bishop Agapirus didn't live long. He died in Ponza on April 22nd. 536. Speaking of Ponza, this is an island not far from home. As you can see, it is a beautiful place to die. Agapiros was only 46 years old. Some historians claim that he died of poisoning by obscure plots of the emperor's wife, the venerable Theodor. Well, I don't doubt it. When he heard the news, Vigilius went happily to Rome. After all, he was taking a lot of money to buy influence and he had everything to be in an expo. But to his disappointment, when he arrived in Venice, he knew that Silverius was already installed St. Peter's throne. Remember the Ostrogoths? So, they were the ones who built the cars in Rome. So, his king Theodorus had placed Silverius Pope. But who is this Silverius? He was the legitimate son of the late Pope Homestas. Wait a minute. Pope with children? Yes, my friends. The church had not created celibacy yet, remember? On the next videos I had, I will tell you who created this law not based on the Bible. The Romans hated the Theodoros and the Ostrogoths, but the guys were well armed and numerous, so it's better to obey than lose your head, right? You must be wondering, but what about the conclave? How were popes chosen? Around those times, there was no such a thing as conclave. It was kings and emperors who nominated the pope and the people generally accepted the nomination. Of course, Vigilius was not happy with the situation, but for now, there was nothing he could do. However, General Belisarius, who had just defeated and destroyed the Vandals in North Africa, was coming home to withdraw the power of the Ostrogoth of the city. In fact, Belisarius entered Rome on December 9th in the year 536, and Theodore's successor, King Witigis, lived a siege on Rome that lasted 374 days. This happened in 537 until 538, and it's called the Great Siege of Ostrogoth. But around March 12, year 538, the Goths decided to abandon the siege on Rome. Consequently, in 538, for the first time since the end of the Western Imperial lineage, the city of Rome was free from the rule of an Aryan kingdom. Remember Aryan Christians, those who believed that Jesus was the first being created by God? The end of the siege didn't signify the end of Ostrogoth king, but the great Ostrogoth monarchy in Italy was dug on the defeat of the siege. But let us return to the story of a poor bishop Silverius. He was accused of treason during the siege. The charge was that he was betraying Rome and that he was going to hand over the city to the Goths. It's obvious that the story was stupid, but in any case, Belisarius was convinced by his wife Antonina to depose Bishop Silverius. Thus, in March of 537, Silverius was deposed from the position of Bishop of Rome and sent as exile to Patara in Lycia. In his place, our known Vigilius was installed as the new Bishop of Rome. Silverius managed to reach Constantinople and put his case before the Emperor. The Emperor, convinced of Silverius' innocence, sent him back to Rome and ordered that Silverius had a fair trial. 
It is when Vigilius reminds Belisalov of the 700 golden coins. So, instead of a trial, Silverius handed over to the new bishop Vigilius, who banished Silverius to the almost inhabited, inhospitable island of Palmarola. There, poor Silverius is starved to death a few months later. Take a look at the island of Palmarola. It's not far from Ponza, where Agapyros had been poisoned. Silverius considered saint by both the Western Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. As for Vigilius, as soon as he assumed the throne of St. Peter, he didn't fulfill the promises made to the Empress. The Roman clergy wouldn't allow it, but no one would make the Theodore such a betrayal without paying the price. The fact is that Vigilius was brought by force to a council in Constantinople in 547 and he remained almost as captive there until 555. That is, eight long years. This is just for you to realize that the Pope still didn't have much power and was under the Emperor's orders. But soon, the day will come when kingdoms and emperors will kiss the feet of the Roman Popes. Let's wait. In 555, after settling with Emperor Justinian, Vigilius was returning to Rome very happy. When the ship reached Syracuse Island, he died of poisoning. Who poisoned him? The crime fell upon his successor, Pelagius. Vigilius died hated by the clergy of the West and the East, because at the council sometimes he was on the side of one party, then was on the other, always according to what he considered to be more convenient, according to the occasion that he displeased both parties. If you have watched our first video, you must be asking yourself, what relevant fact occurred in 538 that begins Daniel 7's prophecy? Let me see. For the first time since 576, Rome doesn't have a barbarian kingdom on the throne. Remember the three horns, Erli, Vandal, and Ostrogoth? These three peoples of Aryan Christians are now past. A new power begins to rise in Rome and the Justinian Code promulgated four years before was effectively implemented in Rome, even given the Pope the right to persecute the heretics, that is, all those who didn't agree with the doctrine of the whole mad church. The Code was too hard toward the Jewish people. Because of that, the history showed tremendous persecutions against them promoted by church. Thousands and thousands were sent to the fire just because they were Jews. It reminds us of a certain stupid ideology that swept Germany last century. Vigilius' story has many other boring, nauseating details. I spared you. But in this video, you could see that the so called successors of St. Peter didn't hesitate to betray and kill opponents to take the papal throne. You're gonna see worse in the next videos. So, I'm going to finish our story right here today. Thank you for watching our video. Press your finger the like button, please. Subscribe to our channel and press the bell. You'll be notified of the next videos. See you.